Hello and welcome to the Psychic Stories podcast, encouraging conversations about mental health. Today I'm speaking to Minty Sheridan. Minty is the founder of Let's Get Men Talking that aims to change the narrative surrounding masculinity and enable open conversations surrounding everyone's mental health. Minty, hello. Hello, thank you so much for having me. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. I'm sort of learning to take it slow in the new year and and, um, take plenty of desk breaks and stuff like that so I'm feeling good today how are you good yeah I'm very well yeah to be honest I can I can empathize with that I do think starting your day in the right way having a nice break through throughout the day and actually taking control of what you're doing especially when you are not being fixed to your desk really does help but hopefully we'll go on to talk about that a little bit that would be great Um, so the goal of today is to have an open and honest conversation about your mental health journey to get some insight into the tools and techniques that have helped you and are available and accessible to other people and by discussing your journey we hope to share and normalize conversations about mental health as often people are not alone in these experiences that sound okay that sounds ideal awesome now we have consent to proceed um minty please yeah we'd love to know a little bit more about your mental health journey yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, my key focus in mental health at the moment is let's get men talking and, and getting people talking about their own mental health um, journey. So it's it's strange but exciting to be here talking about my own. The sort of um, inspiration for let's get men talking didn't really stem from anything, any experience that I had. Um, but I have experienced anxiety and panic attacks, um, and. I just remember the feeling that the first time that someone says, oh yeah, I get those. Like, it's really normal. Like, of course I get those. And I, you know, lived for probably a year and a half without realizing that they were quite a normal thing because, Mm. you know, this was 10 years ago and no one, no one spoke about how they, how they are. They spoke about, I'm good. How are you? Like, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's always, but it's still, still to this day, you will say, hi, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm okay. Not bad. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, even at the beginner's conversation, I always try and answer with a few more words even if you didn't mean to hear them sometimes it's like okay great (laughs) why are you telling me that but but also I suppose as well like if you are in a bad place like if someone does say how are you and you know and the response is always "Mm, pretty pretty average to be honest like Mm. whilst that's good and honest like I think there is a balance and there's certainly different people you can tell that to um to kind of I suppose get the right reaction the support you perhaps need Totally. And that's kind of what I realized at that point. Was firstly, the first time someone um, expressed that they had the same thing and I knew I wasn't alone. That was a massive kind of weight off my shoulders mm. and a massive pivotal turning point in, in working towards getting less of them um, or, or knowing what, that there were resources out there and stuff like that. Um, so that was really a really important part of the journey. But also it really taught me who to open up to about different things and that you have lots of mentors in your life and they're good for different things. And whilst I, I'm really lucky, I can tell my mum and dad anything, mm. you know, sometimes my oldest brother is better for advice for this and my middle brother's yeah. better for that and this friend's better. And it kind of like really helps you to create boundaries um, with different people and also to find, to create, you know, a mentorship around you, which I think yeah. is a really important part of, of life yeah I, I couldn't agree more and, and I think having that that web around you of support and I think acknowledging that you don't need to go to every friend for support you, you, you could have your best friend which actually might that person might not be very good when speaking about your mental health or you might meet someone maybe through work who just so mm-hmm. happens to be the best person you've ever spoken to about mm-hmm. your, your mental health and you click on that level it's nice to have that balance and acknowledge that when you are feeling a little bit low and I think it helps if it's a reciprocal arrangement. Well, I've got I've got a friend who, you know, if he's low, he texts me. If I'm low, I text him. So th- there's a nice kind of building of that relationship. Yeah, exactly. And that's and that's kind of what it is. And also to have that, you know, it's quite a nice feeling to have someone trust you as well sometimes. And mm. you learn so much from people who open up to you. And I think that's one of the biggest things is when people struggle to open up about their mental health because they don't want to put their load on someone else but what they could be doing is giving a gift to someone else the gift of opening up themselves or the gift of feeling a little bit responsible for some you know for for making someone's day because like all you need to do when you know someone's struggling is send them a text every now and again saying I'm thinking of you and you know all that these little details kind of outweigh all the little bad things that are going on in here yeah. so it's yeah. really um it's a really nice way of thinking and those those little those little details like they really not really nice really nicely put that can really 
lift someone's spirits who's in a really who might be in a really dark place and i think during lockdown like there's a lot of people who during their days if you if you haven't found that routine that works for you you know you can get into a pretty dark place quite quickly and a very isolated place and if you're not reaching out or people aren't reaching out to you it can feel very lonely yeah exactly and even you know it's depending on the narrative you've got going on inside your head but even if you have that those people around you and you're talking to someone on Skype every day and you know it is it can be a bit of a performance and it can be a bit you know you can still feel isolated even though you're yeah. having regular conversations if those conversations aren't necessarily meaningful yeah so going back like 10 years when you said you were having those panic attacks like I haven't experienced a panic attack um so I'd just be interested to understand like from your perspective, what, what, what does that feel like? Because I know people listening, there'll be a lot of people who do, um, but for those who don't, it'd be interesting just to hear exactly how that felt at the time, if you don't mind. No, absolutely. So the way that I have been told is that, is that there are three types of panic attack or triggers of panic attack. Um, let's call them categories. Mm. And um, I can't remember what the third one is, but the first is you think everyone's looking at you. So it's a social mm. angst. And then the one that I had was, essentially a fear of death like I was just petrified of, di mm. of, of dying and everything that happened and it sounds so strange looking back on it but it didn't feel strange at the time mm. it felt really rational so I was in a car accident and we've had had some I guess um childhood experiences as a family my mum was in a really bad car accident she she crushed her femur Mm. into in about 40 different places oh, so sorry and had metal put up the top of her leg we, oh, oh you know there's those are, I don't want to go into her story because that's mm. her story to tell yeah. but it was a, it was a kind of retrospectively a, a family trauma yeah. and we're so lucky that um you know she's now in great form and legs mm. healed with a big metal rod and all that kind mm. of thing mm. um but when I was in a car crash we were driving um back from watching the London Marathon and the dry the driver hit essentially a puddle and it span out of control and i don't i we were we were probably going around 70 miles an hour um and we were in the fast lane of a motorway so we wow. span across the our side of the motorway all three lanes and then we shot backwards over a ditch and then that deer fencing that you sometimes see on the side is so strong it projected the car forward now the adrenaline for me slowed everything down and you know you can go into fight or flight mode and you can you know you'll either start screaming or you'll kind of go to slow and rational and think things through and that's what i did i i put i slowed down and i put my hand on the handbrake just in case there was a time the right time to pull it that could help just in case there was something i could do to help and I think I even remember saying out loud, the driver was going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And um, I think I even remember saying something like, it's okay. Yeah. And I, in, at that point, like, really in my head, I absolutely 100% was, I'm gonna die. This is it. I'm absolutely fine with that, but I'm gonna put my hand on the handbrake just in case. And yeah. I guess like the, the crash must have taken about 10 seconds. I don't know how I had time to do all this, um, but that is literally what went through my head. So we go backwards, catapulted forwards, everyone walks out the car. There was one one door that wouldn't open and the passenger had to go to the other side. But So you're incredibly lucky. We were absolutely fine. Like nothing bad happened, nothing physically bad happened. The car was written off, but it was, there was no fire. No, no, like completely, once we walked out that, we went from, you know, the high level of like calm or adrenaline yeah. and, and then just to like, oh, well, nothing's happened now. But I guess for, for me, it did bring up back, back a bit of, um, I guess, a level of empathy that I didn't know I'd experience about how, how it could have been for other people who have been in crashes and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And I had that feeling of I'm going to, I'm going to die. And, you know, we went home and, and we were okay. And I think the biggest thing at that point was to make sure that um, we went back to stay with my mum that evening and her biggest thing, you know, our biggest thing was to make sure that the driver was okay. Cause you know, she had two people who were quite like, she was responsible for those two people in the car and wanted to make sure she could get back in the car and, and drive again. So, you know, we all went to bed that night, but I did have a bit of a like cry because I was like, oh my gosh, that was so like, just so relative to like what could have happened you know I could I could really feel that you know something could have happened and and so 
life goes on and and um but i do start getting these panic attacks after that and this yeah. this is where this fear of dying and and yeah. just little things like i hated getting on the tube because i was like i didn't understand why it wouldn't crash mm. and then it and then it went to so i'd get the bus but then i'd have a fear on the bus and then i would get off and walk and i would i by the time I, you know and then I would make myself lunch and I'd put it down on the side and then I'd be like, what if there's something, a cleaner on this toxic cleaner on the side, what's this bleach? What if I eat bleach and then I'm, and then I'm, I'm going to die. And then it, so everything, and I'd literally yeah. throw the sandwich in the bin and remake it. So, you know, everything, the panic attacks could be waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat. Yeah. They could be um, sort of going, going about your day and sitting on the bus and letting this narrative in your head, just go round and round and round. And, um, you just lose your breathing and I remember once sitting in the bath and, and I felt like I was going to have a panic attack so I sat in a cool bath to like slow everything down and it went from panic attack to like I'm this is definitely a heart attack and and I we, we drove to hospital because right. I, I thought I was going to die like right. and and so and I've had a couple of things like you're until you start googling it and start learning to recognize the symptoms it feels so physical mm. and and you know you say it's a mental health thing but it it's and it just shows you that it shows you the power of your mind mm. and what an exceptionally powerful tool your your mind can be and actually if it can be that badly powerful yeah. what good can it do as well you know what can the power of positive thinking do as well and and in that situation like you said you you, you fortunately came out of that accident you know without any physical you know damage but what was clear is that it was a hugely traumatic event and in terms of your experiences maybe like you said to date like that changed the way that you you perhaps your brain perceived the world you perceive the world and suddenly your 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 mind is trying to protect you against everything which mm. is might cause you death which is almost a, gone to the complete extreme yeah and it's doing it out of like i suppose you know it's, it's doing it out of survival and i suppose love for you as well isn't it it wants to protect you and if you can kind of like separate the two um i find that really interesting that that kind of protective mechanism can at the same time be so harmful and, and so destructive and so you know and it, it can stop you in your life um, I, I assume that those, those those panic attacks would would interrupt your life and make you you know less focused on or, or whatever else you were doing Totally, it, it was quite disruptive, and I was lucky that I was at the age where it was like I started at university, and then I um, changed universities because I didn't like my course, um, and mm. started again in London. And so, you know, it wasn't a time where it was like I had to be at work or anything like that because uni is different. Um, and so, but at the same time, that was also a problem because when I got to London, it was very fast paced, and I think going from being a little countryside kid to like in the big city there's like it's actually quite exhausting <laughs> like yeah. London that energy can when you first get here it takes you a while to adjust so you know things like true <laughs> <laughs> it really does <laughs> um so things like you know not getting enough sleep because you're making new friends and yeah. going out and all that kind of stuff and like you know that that life balance has such a, a massive impact on it on it as well so yeah it was a really the timing was mm. um, interesting but it definitely changed how I behave like yeah. you know I would I would literally walk three months by the time I was getting um my my for me the thing that helped me was cognitive behavioral therapy mm. and by the time it went to getting that um I was walking at two, like three miles instead of getting the bus right which is very good for you but I, well, I was gonna say, so you're, you're exceptionally fit but probably walking 50,000 steps a day which is perhaps a little you know but perhaps not needed at the time I think fitness is is about well-being and and that should be a choice not not like I'm being yeah. I'm doing fitness because I am scared of dying <laughs> yeah, absolutely right <laughs> So in that, because you know, I think that you know, I think what you mentioned about you know transition, that transition from 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 a kind of countryside life, or say rural life, into kind of urban life, it is a huge transition at the same time. And I assume that can play in your mind. And I just as soon as you said that, it just it made me smile because I've got a friend who you know who lives out of town, and he said, and and he's from Wales. He's like Matty. Every time I come into bloody Paddington, I step off the train. And God, you walk fast. And he lit. <laughs> and, 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 and do you feel that? You feel that rush. Mm. You get off the train. You had a really nice weekend away from London. So you get on, and suddenly there's this 
pull and everyone starts walking faster and the kind of your heart starts racing and you kind of yeah. get back into that urban thrill. And I, you know, I think he's got his own idea. Urban living does take its toll. Oh my gosh, totally. And actually I used to, um, my brother lived in New York and when I used to go and see him, you would get off the plane and it would be like, yeah, <laughs> like, just, like, everything and the energy. And he would be like, Mint, can you feel that energy? And he'd be like, that's not going anywhere for your whole trip. And he was like, that's not like an adrenaline of getting off the plane. That is, that is the energy of New York. And he was so accurate. Like it's just, it's like countryside, London, New York. <laughs> and it, it's so true. If anyone, if anyone listening has ever been to New York and ever heard of, you heard of Barry's Boot Camp. I yeah, yeah, I've been there. there. <laughs> I went to Barry's Boot Camp in London, which which someone took me to, and I thought, wow, that was mental. Barry's Boot Camp in New York. I've never seen anything like it. That is like, that's like something on speed. The energy, the the music, the love, the high fiving. Oh yeah, mm. I've never experienced anything like it. I'm personally, for my own well being, I'm not sure I've survived there personally. Would you survive <laughs> in New York? I have always had a soft spot for for New York. I have to say, but I've also always had a, had a want to like you know go and live in the countryside as well. So I think I have a conflicting personalities. <laughs> I, I love it. I think I'd want, I, I think I always love that feeling of landing in London and, yeah. and no matter where I go in the world and I get there and I'm, I want to live here. And then by the time you land, you know, this, this is for me home, but I would have loved to have done a year or two or three, like yeah. that would have been amazing. And just going back your, your experience, you said that was something that really helped you. Cause we're talking about this kind of tools, tips, techniques, you know, we hear, we hear a lot about CBT, like that is from our, from, from my understanding, the kind of, you know, uh, the, I suppose the rewiring of the way your, your thinking works, the mm. rewiring those patterns. So you're thinking of more, I suppose, more positively, maybe more productively so you can carry on with your life. How did that work for you in terms of how do your thought patterns change from going to thinking that I'm scared of death and scared of death to something a bit more positive? And was there a, was it a spectrum of change as well? Um, it makes me laugh because my friend used to um, come to uni with apples. Like, I sound really okay. I sound like I'm be being really pernickety, and I promise you, I'm quite like you know. I grew up in the countryside. I've got two older brothers. Like, mm -hmm. I'm quite capable of like getting messy and all that kind of stuff. Like, I'm not. I've got a very girly feminine side, but I've also got quite a kind of. Um, I, you know, I can play to a masculine ro role as well, and. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I sound really silly, but with the food thing and putting it down the table, my friend used to bring apples in her handbag, um, loose, like no bag around them. And she used to make me eat them. So like, and it was as in like, <laughs> for me, I was because like, she knew she, she was the person who one time, like in the middle of the night, I was having a panic attack and I was at home on my own. And she got a bus the whole way across London at mm. three o'clock in the morning or something. And, and well, that's a good friend. And, yeah and she just sat with me on the doorstep oh. while I calmed down and then stayed with me and it was she's so nice and and, and then they're, they're on like she would tease me and and I think for me you know in a nice way in like a really mothering nurturing way and for me that was a nice thing you know I've got uh, again like with two other brothers they if you're they get a really good line with like bantering you when you're taking things too seriously in your own head and yeah. and creating that ease and making you laugh or being there and listening to you so I think I was really lucky that that she had that balance with me as a friend at the time mm. um between yeah taking the piss essentially and and um but also helping um and and um yeah then and the CBT was the next thing and and it was amazing because it wasn't you know at the beginning of the process you talk about what's happened and what how you're feeling from there on out um it's really about proactive measures and kind of and it's a really logical way of dealing with it and I think actually on let's get men talking it's something that helps a lot of the guys that I talk, talk to yeah. um a lot of their their journeys sort of start to alleviate and change when they have CBT and I think it's really you know simple it's things like instead when I was lying in bed instead of thinking over and over and over letting my mind race and go in those kind of like circles that your mm. mind can go in I would lie there counting the tiles on the roof. Okay, yeah. And like, it's just, it's not, it's retraining your brain and giving it other things to think about. And, yeah. um, you know, when I, I get on the tube and I'd have breathing exercises to do on the tube and you 
suddenly you're so busy worried that you're looking like a prat for doing <laughs> breathing right. exercises in the middle of a public place although now it's really normal with like headspace and stuff like that people yeah. are always sitting there doing breathing exercises but yeah things like that and it's just kind of um I guess it's logical and proactive measures which suits me really well because I guess at the time I I when you've got a fear like that, you spend enough time in the day thinking about what's going wrong. You don't want to yeah. then have another hour that's just dedicated to thinking about what's going wrong. Yeah, and I and I can really appreciate that, and I, I can see I can see how I mean it's it's very logical. Like if if your mind does go to that place where you're thinking I'm you know I'm on the tube, I'm scared, I'm going to work, I'm going to get off to get on the bus, and it's disrupting that way. You can see that how by interrupting that kind of flow. And say right i'm going to i'm going to do some breathing exercises i'm going to you know you know even count people on the tube or a bus whatever mm -hmm. it is but it enables your mind just to i suppose refocus yeah exactly yeah yeah it's really nice and it kind of um it takes time it, and but you can see the impact straight away mm. um you can see that it is helping and it's such a long-term fix and it's just yeah. you know even things like when you can't sleep it all those exercises come back in handy in, in the future yeah and it's it seems to me that cbt is it provides you with a toolkit that you can go on with so whilst it might be you know like you said you you need to go and you know offer, even if you're going to nhs you've got to pay to see someone hmm. but what you're getting if frankly it's an investment and you've got a little toolkit that you're able to kind of process and continue your life with yeah and i think because this might be off, off the subject a bit but because we you know, in England, we have the NHS, so we yeah. feel like we have almost like a right to free healthcare. We don't prioritize spending on it in the same way. So, mm -hmm. you know, so you, can, you can say to someone, it's going to be cost you 50 quid a month to get these CVT lessons for three months, whatever it is. Yeah. And, and, um, and really that is like, a, maybe you say no to a couple of dinners or, or to trips to the pub or whatever it is. Yeah. And, and like, and we, we, don't don't reprioritize you know in france they'll go to like the dentist once a year and the mm. and, and the gynae and they'll go to the derm the dermologist derm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i don't even know what it's called okay, okay. the skin <laughs> um, one that the one. skin one and they'll go <laughs> to their physio and all that kind of stuff and they'll just like you know give themselves a full refresh and it's like yeah. this kind of preventative measure that absolutely leads less injury and, and illness same and it's the same with mental illness but i think yeah. and i think it's a self-care thing and i think before people saw self-care as selfish and and now mm. we're learning to see self-care as actually like really important especially to take the pressure off places like the N nhs yeah. um, so we're becoming more preventative and actually um as an I as I said earlier, like I, I haven't had CBT for about ten years, but mm. if I'd had it at this age, these are absolutely tools that I would use, like at work and um, as I'm going, you know, going to sleep and all that kind of stuff. Like, it, it, yeah, it's incredible to see the power that it has for people and how like liberating it is. Yeah, and and, and these tools, like you said, you know, they're, they're, they're not they're easily accessible. They're they're simple mm. tools, but and they're very transferable. And I think you know, and we we talk often about like in in, in psychic, especially with our app as well. It's about supporting people through life's ups and downs throughout the the, the, the transitions they have. And like you you went through a particularly traumatic event, which you know you know you know, God forbid, other people don't necessarily go through mm. those kind of events, but we all go through the similar types of emotional transitions that might be going through school to university to college mm -hmm. you know and in that is a lot of you know you know for school bullying um uh, your first love relationships and then you can go through to you know to breaking up with relationships marriage mm -hmm. divorce babies whatever you know and then you go to the end of your life with with bereavement and this these these simple tools can help you cope through those times and of course you need some sometimes some more specific intervention something maybe a little bit more serious if you're really struggling you have some you have some, you have some trauma to get through but mm -hmm. these toolkits are they're, they're, they are available and they're free and like you said if you invest in them now you can you can build a life that is you know more resilient to those changes and transitions and able to you know for you to able to flourish yeah, and that's the thing, as you say, like you do not have to have walk out of a car crash to get panic attacks. Like yeah. your first breakup can be as traumatic as mm. I found that car crash. Like it's all relative, and um, and there's no reason for like you know, and 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 it basically, it's essentially how we deal with that is emotional intelligence, mm. and I think that's a big thing. It's a big part of growing up, and they don't teach you, you know spoke about relationships earlier they don't mm. teach you what a toxic relationship looks like and they don't teach yeah. you what um how it feels to suddenly feel like you're getting older and they don't teach you you know how to fall in love kind of 
mindfully and all that kind of stuff yeah, and so yeah. it's, like, it's that kind of thing it's like building this this toolkit and this and it actually even now I'd say it's taken me I'm 30 and it's taken and I've run a business for maybe seven years and it's taken me this long to really feel and a pandemic to really feel as though I've got a better life balance with work yeah, yeah. you know so you know my my family are kind of entrepreneurial as well and mm. you know we it, it, it there's no line between yeah. life and work and it's really stressful and tiring and I've had like you know exhaust phases of exhaustion and all this kind of you know it's I'm sure a lot of burnout as well like, right yeah burnouts it's like had a big, big hormonal impact for me like look you know it's really it can be really physical when you all these really small things like waking up in the morning and looking at your phone before you look at anything else and yeah. and it's just it's building that emotional intelligence and that toolkit as you grow up I always see it as like um gear changes yeah. so every time I learn something that makes my life a bit more logical and seamless it's like you know you know the little things like um not just washing up but putting away and washing up all at the same time <laughs> like, and it's like gear change ah oh, my life's just a bit easier now and it does feel easier doesn't it like and and I suppose that kind of those processes as you start to integrate you know into your life you start to and it feels satisfying don't you you kind of think okay life isn't as necessarily you know maybe whatever you're going through life isn't as hard as maybe I perceived yesterday which is a really well I think I think it's a it's a nice differentiating factor every day to make yourself feel positive and if if the goal of every day is to make yourself feel positive and to design a life in a balanced way where you're able to deliver that then that to me looks like quite a positive life totally and actually I, I used to do this with it so but what you just said really reminds me of it. when my mum gave up smoking she said to herself that she'd always just have the next cigarette and when I started a business and and things do happen when you run a business even if you like you know even if you don't do anything wrong you come across a, a, in work toxic relationships just yeah. as you do um in in la you know mm. romantically and um and you have to learn to build like barriers and boundaries and all that kind of stuff and you come across so many different people and um I'd always just think after my first like few work traumas I would just think I'm gonna get upset about the next one because mm. this is making that one look so tiny I wish I hadn't spent my energy on that one yeah. and I think you know it's the same with life if you like wh when you can categorize it into work it's really easy to do that but that doesn't mean I'm good at that in my personal life for example mm. so you know you kind of just learn to um say this may seem like the worst thing in the whole entire world mm. right now, but actually there will be something that works yeah. that's worse and I'm going to deal with that one instead. And then when you get to that one, you're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can pass. <laughs> <I'm busy. laughs> but I think like, as you do encounter those situations, like, you know, life can hit you up, down, left, right with, with a whole multitude of, of, of different difficult events. And if you've got that kind of core toolkit that you're building up, it doesn't mm. matter then what hits you you just know that you know, one as you get older you realize that you're not going to die you're just going to get through them so yeah. you know my first breakup I was going to die oh god I was going to die it was awful you know what I mean my heart was broken it was in pieces <laughs> yeah I was on death door. but of course I wasn't on death's door but it felt like that at the same time but now as you start to kind of go through and start to make like you said invest in yourself and focus on yourself about okay I want to actually have a balanced life and how am I going to get there you realize as you start to have some of these you know events you might meet someone like you said who is in a toxic relationship but you can manage it in a way and and also as you get older very quickly you can you can realize who is toxic very quickly like there's some treat often you can you you might meet yeah. someone over a period of you know maybe days or weeks you might kind of go oh actually in a bit even in a business relationship just kind of go actually this doesn't feel like good news and yeah. something you can address much earlier rather than going through it yeah I, you know I think in in movies and stuff you're kind of raised to you're trained to um look for in a partner or even in business relationships um people with the same tendencies as sociopaths like if you if you <laughs> this is what you want from a partner and you're like I want them to be charming and clever and da 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 and then you look at what a sociopath is not not that there's anything wrong with dating a sociopath if they're kind to you um but you know so it's not it's not a good starting point and you like really learn to like to to reevaluate yeah who it is you actually want in your life and actually need and you know for me breakups was a big one I used to be a big big um when people had a breakup instead of saying oh I'm so sorry I say congratulations I love breakups they're the best it means that you've got rid of someone who you're not 
right for because it's a hundred percent one person realizing before the other person that mm. this isn't going to work for some reason or another yeah. and you always think it's they're breaking up with you but they're not they're just breaking up with something that isn't right yeah. probably for both people like what is the likelihood that you 10 years down the line yeah are gonna still you know I've never I've never had a breakout where I've looked back and been like that should have stayed together yeah I, yeah I completely agree I don't think there's any breakups and I'm sure your friends as well where they would say oh that one got away well no they didn't mm, yeah I've never had the one that got away never no and I I think often you have the and I think that the one that got away you don't have people haven't had it because you know it's like with Hollywood romance it doesn't exist yeah. like well maybe it takes you like 10 years to realize that they didn't get away <laughs> <laughs> when you've settled, when when you've settled yeah. down five pegs and you're thinking oh god when you find the right person like really the right yeah. person maybe you're like um they definitely didn't get away like <laughs> In fact, I should have opened the gate earlier. <laughs> <laughs> people, people often say as well, you know, like, oh, you know, I'm not ready to settle down. I'm like, like, why is this? They, they, people talk about settling down. You know, for me, you, you talk about settling up. You know what I mean? Like yeah. The person you should end up with is someone you settle up for. They should be mm. pushing you. They should. Yes, they should be aligned in the in your values. You know, you know, kindness, you know, um, 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 I was going to say kindness, like, you know, um, some form of you know you know moral ethics um maybe like the, how many children you want to have and so, like logistical things like that it's always useful to align on <laughs> i think it, it, it is i certainly <laughs> realize with, with with my wife and i that aligning on those and realizing that our lives might might at some stage want to come together yeah in the same way certainly did make the decision of like oh i want to propose to her yeah much, yeah. much easier Mm, yeah it, it's so interesting it's the same with you know people see marriage often as a destination like I want to get engaged and then and then like that is the yeah. destination in life and that shows that you have this big um big like seal of approval from someone that they want to marry you yeah. but actually that's meant to be the beginning like a marriage is the beginning of something and yeah. it's such an interesting you know as you say it's not settling down it's starting a new adventure and yeah. um if if everyone had an insight on what it's like to be a parent I imagine that no one would say it sounds like settling down it sounds really hard work <laughs> is it like so, so someone said to me like do you enjoy being a parent I was like no <laughs> not at all like like yeah I mean it got it, it makes it makes it makes your life richer deeper uh, you have emotions that you you haven't had before I certainly less selfish so yes it's made me a much better person do I enjoy it on a day-to-day -day basis no I wouldn't say I do um, yeah. there's lots of positives to it as well but it's the hardest thing I've ever done and and, and my wife would agree it's the the and, and we we have we have we have one daughter she's 20 months old um we are not planning to have any more kids like that is for us I I'm pretty certain my head would explode literally it would explode in a mess <laughs> I think yeah I mean it's definitely the first time you do anything as so well hard. it's like it's hard enough let alone if it's the actual human being and it just sadly doesn't sound like it comes out with a pamphlet on <laughs> no there's no pamphlet and also every everything that person or that toddler does you realize it's half of you so you can't be annoyed at her it's like <laughs> like my daughter is she's very willful and you know mm -hmm. I think she gets half of that for myself and my wife and she does something that's you would consider you know like tantrums or naughty or whatever you just think god that's exactly what I would do I just I just can't do it all I want to do is break hold up that... a mirror to your behavior oh yeah uh, uh, <laughs> undoubt yeah literally a mirror like it is exactly what I would do if I didn't have my rational brain a hundred percent I I'm inside <laughs> I'm breaking up and doing exactly the same thing but yeah, I just can't yeah. Tear it. like where your mask isn't doing it but yeah, no not fine. at all um so I'd be, <laughs> nice have a tantrum, though. <laughs> honest, it does help sometimes and it stops their tantrum because they're like dad what the hell are you doing um, <laughs> especially in the supermarket it helps as well yeah when you lie down on the floor anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um i'd be really interested you know you're you're the founder of let's get men talking um mm -hmm. that's talking you know you know to change the narrative around masculinity like how did you get in how did you get involved in 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 that passion in that in that topic um because you know from you know your 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 woman yourself mm -hmm. and it's really interesting I think you know you're, you're really encouraging to get men talking is that something that has come through observation or personal experience and or maybe brotherhood I don't know it I just didn't think it was fair mm. like I, I didn't think it was fair that no guys particularly could sit down and say I mean maybe with maybe I had a few guys talk to me and they were like I'm really struggling at the moment with like what it means to be a man because like you know 
I have held the door open for women all my life. And yes. now I've realized actually whilst, I mean, fundamentally it's polite, it's not like, and a lot of things I think are polite are, are patronizing and, and mm. I, and I don't know how to undo that. And I don't know. And, and, and these conversations were really interesting, but I was like, you know what, if you can't talk about that, then what else can't you talk about? And, and we saw like feminism have a necessary boom and it was so important, but these booms and these social changes and, and equality isn't about pushing someone else down. And, and as you're rising, I think it's important to pull the, you know, instead of pulling the ladder up behind you, actually put your hand down and help the next person who needs help. I just felt like if we really wanted to achieve, a, you know, an actual world where there was no toxic masculinity or no gender kind of um, gap, then we we need to talk to everyone and talk, talk about everything. And so I think that, you know, let's get men talking even already sometimes feels a bit like why is it just about men which is amazing that we've achieved that because um we do need we you know the stats are there that that men don't talk and it leads to suicide and and you know it's suicide above covid above everything else is the big, biggest killer of men between the ages of 20 and 49 so which is frightening like it yeah yeah it, yeah it I, it's just so unex it's just so I don't want to say it's unacceptable. That sounds really silly, but it's just so. No, but but I, I agree. It yeah. is unacceptable. It, it not not in terms of the stats. It's unacceptable that society has has allowed that to happen. It do, yeah, it's really it's such a, a tricky one, and it's become so so. It's it's hard. It's hard, like to start a conversation, and and for me, I'm not a man just in case you didn't know this. <laughs> um, and so I, I have to really try and keep my opinion out of it. This is, I'm like holding and hosting a platform for other people to talk. And the, the way I've got around that is just by asking guys to share their story, share your story. Mm -hmm. So can you share your story if you want to, or can you like support people who do just by double tapping and liking them? And, and that's really like where it's kind of grown and, and where its role sits and I kind of have to stick in that lane and and you know like then I interview people and I just you know sit there thinking about what what aren't we talking about and how can we talk about it so you know instead of saying call the helpline call the helpline actually interviewing people and, and asking who who are on those helplines and asking what people can expect when they call a helpline and I just you know I can't imagine who I where I'd be if I hadn't been able to open up and say I have panic attacks 10 years ago mm. I, can't, I like I can't imagine living with that I think it went on probably for two or three years I can't imagine what 15 years would have been like yeah. So and, and, the, and what would happen after 15 years of those constant thoughts? And like you said, it can for, 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 for many people, those sad statistics, it can lead to some a very tragic circumstance. So many things, so many things lead to suicide, you know, like eating disorders. Mm. Um, it's not just depression and, uh, it, you know, P PTSD. It's not being understood. It's being excluding in society. And my marketing agency has always been about about that it's always been conscious marketing so trying to market to people who instead of through degrading them by like if you don't have this life in your body and yeah. this body then you will be sad it's more like um you know actually treating people as humans and trying to have mm. an inclusive instagram feed and and stuff like that so mm. you know i've always kind of been quite um i've always attempted to be conscious and you can always do better but um mm. i think yeah it's just such a it, it's become it started off as this, well, like, obviously men need to talk to the, it's just become such, so close to my heart. Mm. And it, it's interesting you talk about, because I think you, you mentioned earlier about that kind of the masculinity of femininity. Like, I think there's uh, over the over a period of, and I think in academic circles, perhaps a lot longer, but in the kind of, you know, public consciousness, like the idea of masculinity and femininity just resi re residing solely in the man or the woman or, mm. or, 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 or the, or the or the gender is it's starting to break down a bit and like you said like there is aspects of masculine it seems to be aspects of masculinity and femininity in all of us and to trying to understand that and kind of comprehend that um in the context of how how societal norms are changing at the same time yeah. it, it's confusing and complicated and we're not like you said when with childbirth you don't get a pamphlet and you know there's certainly no pamphlet with this at the same time i'd be interested to hear your kind of you know kind of your your thoughts around that kind of masculinity femininity maybe from your perspective as well i just think so on a personal level and this might not be right and this might just be me but but i hate boxing 
Mm. I really passionately feel claustrophobic when I hear boxing lang language. So saying to someone, you're so pretty, and that's a compliment, right? That's a lovely thing to say, but saying you are pretty to someone every day all their life which mm. is, and this is really like, it's gonna sound like a petty example, but let's just use it as an example. Mm -hmm. I, I know people who therefore are really beautiful and they're always told they're beautiful. And when they're having a bad day, they don't feel like a human. They feel so, and and obviously let's, I'm not sitting around being like, oh, I'm so sorry, pretty person. That must be really hard being you. But I, you know, there's so, I think, I think there's a difference between how we say you are so, you know, you're so funny and then the person becomes the funny person all the time and they do that to mask how they're feeling or, you know, you're so good at football and 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 then if they don't make it here in football, then they feel bad. And, and like, I think we have to allow people to be and be a spectrum. And it's the same with masculinity and femininity. You know, sometimes I am so girly and I've been like this, like you were saying earlier, since I was a baby, I'd wake up one day and I would want to wear fairy wings. And the next day I would want to be a tomboy and I wouldn't even want to look at a skirt. And like, mm. that's, you know, probably who I am today to mm. an extent. And I don't think that there's any, I, I don't think there's any shame in, feminine energy in a man and masculine energy in a woman and I also don't think there's any shame in a woman being completely feminine and a, or, or a man completely, completely feminine or even you know in a woman being a masculine woman and and vice versa so I just think you know we should we we I there's a author called Paolo Coelho and he did a podcast and he said um Someone said to him, how have you been married to the same woman for 20 years? And he said, I haven't been married to the same woman for 20 years. She's changed so much. Yeah. She, she could be a different person every morning. And it's a delight. And I just love the idea of living in a world where we just, you know, instead of saying, mate, why are you dressed like that today? You don't normally dress like that. Yeah. We stop boxing each other and just let someone be and like change and evolve. And I think, you know, it's a big, big thing. You know, we, we really cut that off at the legs at school. Cause if your mate comes in one day and he's normally dressed in tracky bums and uh, you know, then he decides to try and be a bit more stylish. Then you're yeah. like, oh, you know, it, we, we stop each other's growth in a way. Or like, if you go from being laddie to deep then yeah, I, I think there's no shame if you're a masculine man, mm. as in if you're, if you want to be, um, play rugby and you love the kind of like sports culture and stuff like that I think you can still be kind and yeah. and, and be the social sec of a un at uni or whatever it is but um but I so I don't want people to think I'm trying to take away masculinity in that sense but I do um I think we we've got to stop boxing people. I can't remember, remember what the question was. <laughs> no, no, but I think that's, that's a perfect explanation. And I think like you said, like the boxing as well is, you know, how I look at boxing as well is that top down approach is you're putting a box on something. It's going down, you know, from down to up yeah. and it's stifling. Like you say, it's claustrophobic, but at the bottom of someone is their, is their values, is their ethics, their morals. And that might be kind of, you know, some form of uh, a virtue, compassion, um, kindness. And mm. it's, it's, I think we often associate different boxes with those kind of values. Like you said, that kind of laddie uber lad, mm. like you wouldn't, you know, your, your conditioning might not assume them to be, to be kind or mm. to be respectful, uh, maybe of the opposite sex. Mm. Um, and, but actually that's not necessarily the case. And I think both you're right, like not boxing other people in but also don't box yourself. Yeah. Oh, and that's it. That's it. Like how are you meant to start? not boxing ourselves yeah. if everyone else boxes us and it happens a lot you know even in the best relationships it happens it's like oh you're you're rubbish at cooking so I'll be the chef or like yeah. you're not very good at putting things away and you know we do that to each people do that to each other all the time and we make I make a really big effort in my relationship to catch myself when I do that or yeah. annoyingly to my boyfriend probably to catch him as well because I think it's nice that like one day you know I might be rubbish at something but the next day I might want to get up and I want, may, may want to become good at that and I don't thrive on you know being like come on you're not doing this very well I th I've never have in in like fitness classes or at school I thrive on 
you know positive reinforcement not negative reinforcement mm. so if if you want your partner to become better at them like why do we spend so much time telling them that they're not oh, even if it's yeah. adoringly i think we want to get each other though don't we you want to you want you feel more comfortable if you think you know someone mm. and, and how think, do you know someone if they're allowed to change every day yeah yeah absolutely and i think it's it's interesting it's it's i suppose it's allowing like you say it's allowing people to be who they want to be and just accepting them for that like I can see for example like like you, you, you gave a, a great example about you say speaking to your you know your friends who is a, a, a beautiful woman you know you're pretty you're pretty pretty you know from a guy's perspective at the same time like it's like oh mate you're looking good at the moment mm. but actually what us underpinning all that might be this obsession about food or exercise yeah. That actually what you're doing and this is what i think people have got to be very 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 aware of is that the the compliments that you try and give people what one they might be reflecting of your own insecurities mm. i.e oh you're so pretty what you're really saying is i don't feel pretty mm. or it might be oh you're looking great and i really want you to look great but actually you know you've sat here at the pub we've ordered dinner and you haven't eaten anything like mm. is something okay like and it's very complicated and i think you know, I think what's amazing in, in your in your marketing agency, you talk about conscious marketing, you know, but that I mean, I'm not a marketing professional. That to me sounds very hard because I walk around the street you know, when we're not in lockdown mm. and you, there's a lot of negative reinforcement mm. bodies. Yeah, still in, today in 2021. Like, what's the. Yeah. That? So how do you therefore define yourself in the world? How do you define what, who you're known for, what you are, what you do? it's complicated and like you said there's no pamphlet floor for it like we seem to be feeling our way out in the dark yeah it's really it's really hard work and i think it's you know it's the very words conscious marketing and you know are a bit of an oxymoron i try and just make sure that when i look down my clients feeds i'm not leaving people out or yeah. when i um maybe instead of degrading someone into thinking they need something I try and educate them and treat them as intelligent human being and say yeah. like you know here you know break it down instead of like business explaining to people just talking mm. to them you know if it's b2b marketing rather than throwing big jargon in there that scares the shit out of you and makes you think oh, I don't know anything about this like mm. I must need it R rather than thinking that like empowering people to understand what I do and how it's helping them and what they should be looking out for is a measure of success of success and stuff yeah. like that so that's what it means for me it's it's you know we do still live in a world where it's so easy on social media to hide behind the mask of values and pretend mm. you're doing good when actually you're still doing you know you're, you're you can't be good for everyone you know on yeah. social media you may be the kindest person but some days if i'm not feeling good about myself mm. i'm gonna see that post come up where you're being really kind and be like that could be toxic for me on that day because i'm not i'm i've something's going on with me and that's my fault and I think you know that's where this sort of having a conscious use of how you use social media as well like we need to start forming kind of um more education around around that as well like how we make that a non-toxic place for us yeah. and perhaps looking more broadly as well it's about it's about for us being more conscious just generally in life you know you know i you know you know you know if you've, if you've traveled to other cultures you can dig definitely get a sense that you land in a new place and i'm not talking maybe necessarily in, in, in the western europe but maybe if you've gone to you know i used to work in down in nigeria completely different culture something you know very different for me there's a you can get a sense that there's very different values there a lot of community traditions and and ways of thinking and patterns of thinking that I think could be very positive. So I think opening yourself up to understanding where your maybe your kind of your societal flaws are, where your yeah. little you know microcosm flaws are, and then trying to embrace some of those different values and trying to kind of trying to cultivate them is you know consciously is important. And I think essentially what you say about the you know your your side of the conscious marketing, looking down those fees, it's like at the same time it's about it goes back to the CBT, isn't it? It's about recognizing those negative patterns and trying to do things in different ways, which is, is which takes a lot of energy. So yeah. how do we get enough energy to every day go out into that big wide world and try and, you know, try and challenge those norms, try and challenge those distinctions. You know, the, 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 you know, like you said, the distinction between masculine and feminine, like what does that mean for you? Have, have these conversations with each other and ourselves. And I do feel like if we open this, you know, like we've had this conversation today, like we've spent mm -hmm. 50 minutes having a conversation where, you know, it's not a typical work conversation and actually, but hopefully you, you know, us and the listeners leave it 
having thought about something and maybe the way that our minds have interpreted something, perceived something will change in, 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 in for future so that we might be benefiting other people in a more positive way. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's where it, it all this is, is, and I'm not perfect, perfect at it either, um, but it is about developing our emotional intelligence. Like we talk about mental health and, and mental illness, and that's, you know, your OCD and your um, anxiety and bipolar and, and things like that. And then you've got um, just genuine day-to-day -day emotional intelligence. Mm. And that's what we, you know, following people like Jacqueline Hurst on Instagram, who's GQ's um, life coach writer and she posts videos of like you know um how to not feel sad when you can't get a job and all that kind of stuff and and like you know finding someone who you feel like has aligned values with you and, yeah. and you know and that I was interviewing someone yesterday who is um and she actually has a a life coaching class and and you can do do kind of a foundation that just helps you with you and then if you want to become a life coach you can go on and do the more the more detailed one and then I was talking to the founder of OSPA which is a life coaching app and it as well and it's like there's so many more solutions coming out from this genuine genuine need and you know I think you're right with traveling when we go to another country and talk to people from different cultures it's you feel like you've had a whole life revelation don't yeah, you you yeah. feel like you know so I've heard people come back from traveling like change people and they, um, I want to save the world yeah exactly do you know what I put this plastic bottle in the bin and it ends up here in a big ocean in the you know big um, island <laughs> in the ocean and you suddenly realize your your impact on um and but how you're different and how other societies can can do things better and we even though we've been trapped and stopped traveling I think now we're more global mm. as a community than we've ever been because you know we care about what's going on over here and over here and over mm. here like American politics the farming um the farming issues going on at the moment and then mm. we've got you know there's a Black Lives Matter movement earlier mm. in lockdown and all that kind of stuff and we're like perhaps we're um demanding accountability from companies and we want to shop through companies who we feel like, a, you know, every penny you spend vote is a vote on the kind of world you want to live it. Yeah, yeah, in. yeah. You know, we're we're just becoming. Um, it is. It's all like life coaching. It's yeah. literally, and and people yeah, yeah. think that life coaching is this like big kind of. Oh, I don't need that. I don't need help being alive. But we kind of all do. Why not? Like, yeah. And and those and often those people will often be paying for personal trainers. And I've I've noticed this 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 similarity, you know. I you know, say to them, I say, you're paying for a personal trainer. Why do you know pay for a coach? Oh, because mm -hmm. you know it's ridiculous. Why could they do that? So well, hold on, like you're training your body, like you know, your I think, mind is a is mental fitness. A hundred percent. And yeah. you know, I think like what really interesting you're saying about that you kind of we're we're more globally connected. Yeah, we are, and globally connected, but also interconnected. I think we're really realizing now that whilst there's a huge differences, we have a huge in different cultures and different countries have lots mm. of different range of experiences but actually as humans we do suffer and feel the same emotions mm. and we can talk to you know i you know i think we're on i'm not sure exactly how many but maybe 25 or 30 episodes of this podcast from oh. and i spoke speaking to people from across the world and so cool well, well yeah it's great it's great to chat but you just realize you think hold on i'm like i'm speaking to someone in the deep south of america from the black community who yeah has a completely different experience and perception of of the world through through um through 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 the way that they live their lives and ancestral history mm -hmm. etc and but what how they're expressing that is with those same emotions that i can actually empathize with and i say look i don't i yeah. can't begin to understand the extent of the suffering in your situation but mm -hmm. i can talk to about i can talk about it and i really think that that's a really interesting in a way and the way that we can then deal with those emotions there's a common set of tools you talk about your breathing exercises to see yeah. what you see. like that's going to help someone in deep south of america as much as it's going to help someone in the uk or in europe or in south america like you know those those tools and techniques like they are there to help your brain and we all have brains you know i know it's i know it might be slightly naive to say but we are you know the, 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 there is a level where of course on the surface we are we are different and black lives matter really has shown that that and there's called cool structural inequalities within society but underneath that we're still processing those emotions and we can help process each other's emotions and like you said at the beginning like just by being friends opening your eyes having new friendships to different people with different backgrounds can be a great starting point and just embracing that culture yeah, completely, uh, completely. And actually, you know, that's why we miss out on things like 
pen pals and stuff we yeah. don't really have that i have um a friend of mine still has pen pals and i just think that's so cool yeah it's awesome right? for no reason like there's no there's no reason that's not like you know they're going to those countries or anything but it's mm. just to find like-minded people on the other side of the world and experience to sort of have a richer and wider experience of, of life and um i also think you know having an accountability to someone that you don't know in that in that way is really cool as well like i am going to write to them and you know i have a responsibility to yeah. do that for a bit and, and actually putting other people first as well as like learning and listening and um but yeah it's such a i think it it's been a really interesting time and there's a lot a long way to go but it's so great that so many of these podcasts have maybe they popped up before before 2020 but they're thriving now because um we're learning to listen and communicate and and have two-way conversations again and it's really you know people want to stop and listen to two people like you and me chat um more than just ever chit chat <laughs> yeah. chat about whatever but it's true yeah. you're completely right it's about that listening and if people are taking something positive away from it then frankly that's what you and I, you know, you, you and I have served that purpose. So, you know, for, for me, like Minty, thank you so much for a fascinating and insightful <laughs> conversation. We've gone from an extremely traumatic event in, you know, 10, 10, 10, 12 years ago. And then we've gone all the way through to conscious marketing, which uh, does, does show me as well that everything is really interconnected. So honestly, it does thank feel you. interconnected. I feel like I haven't even tapped into half of the traumas that I could have used to make you cry. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> <laughs> I've, saved, God, but... I've saved my tears but Minty honestly saved. thank you so it's much great for your to time. See you. thank you so much it's been really great chat and um yeah keep in touch sorry about the washing machine if you could hear that going off oh brilliant <laughs> fascinating <laughs> it was so nice to meet you and um yeah talk soon awesome and thank you to everyone listening you can subscribe to us on most major podcast platforms youtube spotify and apple Podcasts. just search for sidekick community or psychic stories and we'll pop up and please do give us a rating if you like the show and and check out our free psychic app for iphone and ipad a collection of interactive exercises tools and tips to help you boost your mental well-being the app enables you to build a personalized well-being toolkit to help you deal with life's ups and downs and the transitions that minty and i have spoken about. Just to go, just go to our website www.sidekick.org.uk and click the download now button in the header to take you to the App Store. Minty, thank you so much again. No problem. I'll be going to the App Store now. Thank you. <laughs>